Happy Sabbath to all of you. Thank you for choosing to be another Sabbath with us. Today we have a really special um, study from the Bible. We will go through many verses, so take your Bibles. Uh, but before we go, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, um, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit will guide me when I speak. Hide me and my heart and enter in my heart the Holy Spirit can really talk, talk and spoke to, to each of us who are listening, that we really uh, make change today, that decided to, to do differently. And I'm praying that in your name. Amen. Many times we uh, already read these verses. I think that's not new for you. And my question is actually how many sermons you heard about that, the armor of God and the shield and the faith and righteousness and all of these Christian terms that we used to use in our, um, in our sermons and in our preaching and our studies. But actually, how many of us are understanding importance of these verses? A couple of weeks ago, we had this discussion in our English prayer group, and I really I saw these verses in a different light. And that's why I decided to share with you today. Because if we really good, very, very well we know the, the truth from these verses, then why we are still keep falling? Why if we know that God is protecting us, that he can, he's able to protect us, and that he is giving us uh, the armor and protection, why still we are falling every day? What is wrong? What we are doing wrong? Maybe we are doing the same what Israel did in the Old Testament. Today we will go to Joshua just just really quick because I promised that there will be New Testament. But let's go just see an example in a last chapter in the book of Joshua. So Israel is standing in a, in a, before a promised land. It's looking on a promised land. And Joshua is standing before them as a pastor. Just imagine pastor standing here in front of church and giving the last warnings. So he's saying to, to his people, uh, can we see the slide? So he's saying, saying to his people, Really famous, actually, sentences. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorite, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua is saying to people to choose who they will serve. Or you will serve the God, or you will serve another gods. And they're saying, Oh, of course, we will serve the Lord. And he looked at them and he's like, but do you know who God is? You're not able to serve the Lord. You're a sinner. You can't really serve the Lord and be faithful to him. And they again, no, yes, we can and we will serve the Lord. We will be faithful to him. And I like what he's actually saying in verse 23. You can open with me, Joshua 24, 23. It's like Joshua is playing with them. He's provoking them. They're saying, yes, we'll be faithful to God. And then he said, well, you're already not faithful to God. Remove all your statues and your idols that you have in your tent, in your home. So actually what Joshua is saying to them, you're promising me here, you're standing before God, and you're saying that in the future you will be faithful to him, but you're not already faithful to him. You already have to, something to clean in your house. And it's actually... Um, when they come and they enter in the promised land, already in the first chapter, we can see that they're winning the battle. And we can see by our eyes and we can think that they're really successful. But actually, already in the first chapter, we can see that they're losing spiritual battle. And that's what Paul is talking about today. He's talking about spiritual battle. Even if we can think that we are winning something in this world, we can lose the spiritual battle. And that's what they lost. They lost God. Already in the first chapter, they enter in the promised land, and really soon they, they left God. So basically, if we want to be one day faithful in the future to God when he's coming and when all this tribulation came, and we say, yes, we will be faithful to him because we know the truth and everything, why are we are so confident? Because maybe already we have to clean something in our house. And the problem with Israel is that they underestimated the enemy. They thought that they're fighting with the people, with the, with the armies. And they know it, yeah, and they even give the list to Joshua. Yeah, yeah we, we know who God is. He battled with us in this, in desert, here and here. 
And they, they thought, oh yeah, even in a new promised land, he will, he will fight for us. But they underestimated the enemy. They didn't saw that actually battle is not the fleshly battle that we see by our eyes, it's spiritual battle. And that's the warning that Paul is giving to Ephesian. And actually the, the, the um, book of Ephesian, it's one of my favorite because it's really easy to read. It's actually, it's a whole gospel in one book. And we know from the revelation that Ephesians was the first church. And actually the first church in fire for Christ. They wanted to preach the gospel like never before. And we know that because of preaching of the first church, from couple disciples, it come to the five million Christians. Just in the first century. Can you just imagine? So this church, like uh, John is describing, oh, you have a love for people. He's doing everything right. But then John said there is something that they missed, and that was crucial. And that was that they, they missed God, actually. They were doing everything for God, but they didn't have personal relationship with God, and they were not protected. That's why as a church, they disappeared very soon, because they were not protected. They didn't be protected from God. And actually, in the whole book of uh, Ephesians, it looked like it's so beautiful to be part of the God's family. And Paul is describing, okay, the first chapter, who is Jesus? What Jesus is do in your life and when you're receiving Jesus and this gift from him oh then it's, you become a member of the beautiful family or the beautiful unity and it looks like it, he's talking about the heaven now because in that in the, in the fifth chapter we can even see that children obeying the parents the parents obeying the children servants obeying the master master love servant so there is like beautiful relationship between people there is love everywhere in the in the unity with God and in the whole fifth chapter, Paul is describing the meaning of the gospel and Christianity. And it's looked like heaven on earth. It's looked like it's already possible to have kingdom of heaven here on the earth. And then it's like, why did he need to, <laughs> to write these last 10 verses? Because actually, last 10 verses, Paul want to say, is not so easy. Once, when you decided to have a heaven on earth, when you want to be part of the kingdom, then don't underestimate the enemy. Then enemies start to attack. When a person starts to study for baptism, then Satan is attacking. Don't think that Satan is very happy. Like, oh, yeah, one new person want to wanna go to the church. Well, I will let this person to go. No, because he knows the influence of that person. He knows that when I wanted to get baptized, that in the future, my husband, my future husband will come to Jesus and he will be pastor today. He knows that. That's why he wanted to destroy my life. That's why he wanted to destroy the life of every person who want to be part of the God's kingdom. And that's why Paul is describing, yeah, God's kingdom is a beautiful stuff. It's beautiful to have Jesus in heart. But don't underestimate the enemy. And that's actually the problem of the Israel. That's the problem of people in Fission. That's the problem of us today. Because we think, oh, easy. Easy we will. God is with us. God is fighting our battle. And we say that and we are living a life kind of hoping that everything will be fine. But we are underestimated the enemy and his power. That's why in Ephesians, in chapter 6, actually God is, um, Paul is describing this power, uh, his power. And he said that actually he's going to us, it's 6.12. Let's go read the Ephesians 6.12. He's giving us the picture. So 6 chapter, 6 verse 12. He is giving the picture that we have a fight not against the men of blood and flesh. And actually when he is using that, uh, that word fight, uh, somewhere is, uh, writ um, is written struggle, but actually originals say wrestle. That means that it's not just global battle, but actually Satan is coming to attack you one by one. He personally wants to destroy you and I. That's, that's like he personally has something against you because you're choosing God. And he will not stop till he will destroy you. And today we will see step by step what he is doing to discourage people. But also we will see step by step how what God is doing to protect his people. And often, very often, as an Israel, that as a people in the first century, we think that we can do alone. We can win this battle alone. That we are, we are not really spending so much time with God because we, some, we just believe. We, we, we think that they're just believing in God that he will protect us and that's it. But we are actually not spending time with him. And 
Uh, we have uh, actually a really, really famous quote of one really good pastor. Um, and he said, if we underestimate the enemy, we will not see the need for God's armament. We will prepare for battle, but we will not even know that we are already in battle. So during the time of all this preparation, we will not even see that we are already in the battle. Uh, the result will then be a swift and disgraceful defeat. You know, the Ephesian, when he is writing something like that to Ephesian, that they have enemy that is not from flesh, they know it exactly what Paul was thinking. Because in the book of Acts, in the ni chapter 19, we have described all these things what happened then in, uh, in, in Ephesians. And we see that many Jewish leaders, pastors, we will say today, or um, leaders from the synagogue, PhD, doctors, whatever, but leaders, they wanted to make miracles also. And they said like, oh, there's not just Christians, Paul and Peter and all of them who are doing miracles. We can do also uh, do the miracle in the name of Jesus. They even say in the name of Jesus we will do the miracles. So they come to the people that were demon-possessed. They came and they wanted to cast the demon from them. And what happened? Do you know what happened? You know what happened? They finished running from demon full of blood and scars because demon attacked them. Because they think that they can do by themselves, claiming that they are doing that in Jesus' name. The thing is that we are underestimate the enemy. He's not easy to defeat. If he's easy, we will not need Jesus to come to save us. So today, let's go really briefly to see some of the characteristics that Paul is describing Satan. So he's saying that Satan is evil. He's saying that he's a powerful. But there is one more thing that he is saying for Satan. He's actually saying this word that he is schemes. He do the schemes, schemes of the devil. What does that mean in verse 11? What is that schemes of the devil? It's interesting that is actually the same term he is using in chapter 4, verse 15, when he's saying that the false teachers will come and schemes and, and the, um, defeat or just lie to people and deceive, actually deceive the people. The same, the same term he is using. So basically, he's want to say that he is really clever. He's a sneaky one. He knows how to get us. So, okay, we know that he's evil. We know that he's powerful. But that's what we are missing. We are missing that he led Eve to the point that she was thinking that she is doing the right thing and she was disobeying the God. That means that you and I, we can believe that we are on a good track, that we are a good Christian, that we will be saved, that everything is fine, but actually we can be deceived and actually disobeying the God. And we are laughing to Eve, but actually... So the whole Bible, we can see that in the whole humanity, Satan is doing the same thing. He is just showing us how weak we are. He is laughing to us. He even came to God and he said, there is no one on the earth who is righteous. There is no one who is faithful to you. That's what he is doing. Um, I don't want to scare you today, but I would like you to be aware who is your enemy. That's why Paul is writing this. That's why he is saying we are not fighting with people from this world. We are not fighting with our bosses or our husbands or wife. Why we even hate them? We are not fighting with them, with our children, with our problems. We are fighting with the spirits that we can't see. And they're much powerful than we think because we can't see the move of them. We don't know what Satan is planning next for you and I. But we know somebody who knows. And that's what Paul is calling us. Please come to Jesus and receive his armor. And that's why he is describing this, what we need. And it's interesting that in verse 10, he is saying that he is calling us, two group of people, by the way. There is two group of people. One group of people who are too confident. They think, I can do all by myself. I don't need God in my life, okay? I can win my battle. And then every day they're falling, okay? And there is another group of people who are super not confident, or not confident, okay? So they're not confident. Okay, sorry for English. Not confident. And they, they think, like, I'm not even worthy to get out of my house. I don't want to serve in the church. I don't want to go everywhere. I'm not worthy. Look at me, my sins. My, I don't have any gifts. So they're not confident. So all of you, two both of this group, they're wrong. Because God is saying them, both of this group, be strong 
in me. He is not even calling you to be strong in you. He's not even calling you to be super confident. He is calling you to be super confident in him. And these three words that he's saying, strong, mighty, and power, he's using also in the first chapter when he's describing that by this strength, might, and power, Jesus was arise from tomb. tomb. That means God is, wants to give us that strong, mighty power that is much powerful than Satan power. Because Satan cannot give a life, but God can. So that's, that's what God is offering us. God is not expecting you from you to have that. He knows where you're living, but he is expecting us to come to him and search for that. But that's the only problem. He can't force you and I. That's our choice. Our choice is to took that armor or just live how we think that is the best. And let's go today see through all these armors. Um, I, I, I believe that you already heard for all of this. And each of these can be one sermon. But we will go through, through all of this um, very quickly. Um, so the first... Actually, it's the belt of the truth. Okay. Belt of the truth is something that was, I consider very funny, because I thought that's something just to put here, where is the stomach. And like we are putting today, when if you're too skinny, then you, you're putting, so it will be uh, tough uh, and strong. But actually, they use that as an underwear, <laughs> as a protector of the really gentle things. <laughs> and, um, and I was asking myself, why that first? Because that's like foundation. Not just that it was protecting the, the, the uh, hurtful things, but also, also was uh, he, uh, holding the dress and also holding the sword. So two things. If there is no foundation, actually the belt, there will be no sword that we need in the future and there will be no dress. You will be naked. And it will be like uh, these, uh, Jewish, um, these Jewish leaders, we will run naked. From, from demon, he will easy uh, catch us. So basically, belt is a foundation. And he's saying here, Paul, that truth is foundation. Paul very know, know it, the, the all these armors of the soldier, of the Roman soldier. And he probably had a picture of them. And we can see in John 8, 31, 32, why the truth is foundation. Why truth is the most important thing that Jesus was saying. He was even proclaiming that, that that's the most important thing. Open with me John 8, you, you have probably on your screens. So John chapter 8, 31, 33. So Jesus is speaking with Jewish, and he said, you have to, have to believe to my word. And then verse 32, he said, you will find the truth, and truth will set you free. From what truth have to set me free? From what? Maybe from the false gospel. Maybe for the people they are claiming that they have a truth. But what is a truth? Jesus said that he is a truth and a life. So if we have a wrong picture about who Jesus is, is, the whole everything what we will just study right now, it will be nothing. It will be no importance because we have a wrong picture about him. And many times today I heard that True actually doesn't matter. From many teachers, I heard, it's just important that you love each other. It's just important that you have Jesus in your life. Yes, but if I don't know who is that Jesus, if that doesn't study and I know the true who Jesus is really, then how I will know that I'm saved? How I will know who Jesus is? You're telling me, just believe in Jesus, but what Jesus? True really matter. Because there is a many, many teachers who are saying, this is the truth, this is the truth. And when I'm studying Bible with people, they're saying to me, what interpretation is true? What is the truth? How can I believe you what is the truth? And then every time I'm saying to them, you will know just if you study in Bible for yourself. But I know that Satan is trying to, to give you so many work today that you don't have time to study the truth. You have more time to listen to the truth in your cars from some speakers or something like that, but you're not having time to prove if that's true or not. But he said that's the foundation. That's the foundation of everything. Because if we don't have the truth, we will run naked. We will be naked. We don't have anything uh, that we can hold on. And the next one is the breastplate of righteousness. Um, this was really important for the Roman soldier because it's protected some of the really important part of the body, like heart, and emotions, we will say, but heart, uh, kidneys, and 
uh, lungs to, for, for breathing. That was really important. And it was not just, even say breastplate on English, it was not just for the, uh, the first part, it was also from, from back, from the back. Okay, um, so why that was important? How many times did you hear righteousness, the word righteousness? Oh, I heard many times. And I have to be honest with you, sometimes it's really difficult to understand that term, righteousness. How many times in the church we heard righteousness? But when Paul is talking about be justified or righteous, he's saying a new restored relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what he's trying to say. And I was asking myself why that is important to protect my heart. Why? And I, then, I, then I remember of all these people that I'm studying Bible. But not just that, many other examples. For example, I was watching one um, really hurtful documentary this week. Uh, maybe you heard of it's new on Netflix. It's about Athlete A. And it's talking about really horrible things that happen in USA gymnastic. And it was 500 cases they had, but probably even, it was even more, but just 500 people were not afraid to say something about that about sexual abusing in, a, in, a, in, a, in sport, in gymnastic. And finally, when True come out, and when so many girls come out and say what they've been through, the first one that came, I was not able even to listen to the other one. I was crying on the first one. She came and she said that everything what happened to her just didn't destroy her, but her family. Because her father was believing that, um, that that's not true. He didn't want to admit the truth. And he didn't believe that that is true, and he was denying that. But eventually, when true comes out, and when he find out, listen to this, when he find out that his little daughter was hurt on the end, he committed suicide. So she said, this guy, he didn't took just my life, but left my father. But her father left a message, and he said, I'm not able to live with such a huge guilt in my heart. And that's what we're people are facing, to, facing today. Even during this corona time, there is more and more suicide that we have. Um, in, in, they're, never, they're not saying that on TV, but many people are doing research. And you can see that there is raising up of number of suicide. But the most bigger, biggest reason of the doing suicide is because they have guilty. I can't live with all my sins. I can't live that I, I, I didn't help somebody. I can't live with my life, my, my everything. And you know, Satan is coming and waving. You're guilty. You're like this. You did that in the past. You will never be changed. Look how weak you are. That's how Satan is attacking. That's why we need righteousness. That's why God said you need righteousness. You need to see that God loves you, even your prodigal son. That God loves you. He's not waiting you to be the perfect to love you. He came, the Bible says he came and you're the sinner already. And people doesn't have a hope. I remember when, when my husband was getting baptized, his father was crying. A couple of us had to hold him because he was tearing apart. He was saying, I'm not worthy to live. People believe that they are not worthy to live. They are not worthy to go to church. They are not worthy to serve. They are not worthy to sing. They are not worthy to do anything. That's how Satan is playing with them, with emotion. He's twisting the emotion. And that's why we clearly have to know, all of us, and we have to preach that, not just know for ourselves, that God is forgiving us. He's justified you. That's why he came, to die when you're already a sinner. That's why we have to protect our, our, our heart and our emotion. But also, we have illustration in Croatia. There is a candy called bronhi. It's really, it's a caramel, but it's also, it's a candy that inside has some herbs. So when, you, when you're eating that candy, then you can breathe easily. And then it's like commercial. Bronhi, you can breathe well. But actually, I say righteousness, you can breathe well. Because by righteousness, by, by his justification, by what he did for you, by his death, you can breathe. That's what he wants from us. He wants that we are breathing, that we are not all the time deceived by all these Satan's attack, that we are not worthy. He wants that we feel like that. That's why we are not able to even stand in the morning and give breakfast to our children, because we all the time feel so bad and so guilty and with so many, so many sins. And the worst is that that's true. That's true. What he is accusing us is true, but it's also true that Jesus loves you. And that's more important, Jesus said. 
And you know, we say the first is the true, but it's actually saying aletheia. Aletheia means not knowing the truth, but living by truth. You know what is important? Because Satan also knows the truth, but he's not shaking, okay? He's not saved. He's not living the truth. We have to live the truth. We have to live this, what I'm actually saying. But people all around, they don't have a hope. They don't know this. And we are so easy target for Satan. We who go into church all the time, we that are supposed to know all this, Israel that's supposed to know because God gave them, Nicodem who was teaching the church, he's supposed to know what is be saved and confident in this salvation. But he don't know. That's why we have to live in the truth. We have to live in this. And how I will know that I'm saved? Because I know the truth. Because in the Bible it says that I'm saved. That's why we have to check the scripture. And the third one is, oh, I love this one, is feet fitted with the gospel of peace. Oh, these special shoes, I, I just love them. I, like, I even like to wear them uh, during the summer. But why they are so special? They are made for two reasons for the Roman soldier. First is for the very long step. So you have to walk miles and miles and miles. But I, I don't know if you know it, that the Roman soldier, he had to sleep in the armor. Did you know that? Because in the middle of the night, it can be attack. So they have to have a, co a comfortable shoes and all these dresses and all these things. So they will be ready in the first moment when they said, let's go to attack, they have to be ready. That means there is no putting out the shoes. There has to be really comfortable shoes. It can't be high heel, you know? Just imagine girls waking, somebody wake you up and you're sleeping in the high heels and you jump in the high heels. I, I don't believe that will be really nice and comfortable to run in a high heel. But they had to be in something that is comfortable. All the time wearing, day and night. What do you have to wearing day and night? Paul is saying gospel of peace. Why peace? You're asking, I'm asking why peace? How many in the world we now see that people are seeking for peace? There is something that every household, every man on the earth is asking for peace. There is no peace in the world. I just saw that this week it was 10,000 earthquake. Just this week in the world. The earth is shaking. The earth doesn't have a peace. Then there's a protest here, protest here, protest here. Then people are really disappointed in all of this corona and mask and everywhere people are trying to find the peace. They don't like the world that it is. They don't have peace in themselves, in the homes, and globally they don't have a peace. So we know the truth. We have the gospel, the gospel that is giving the peace. Jesus is giving the peace. Just look at these verses from Isaiah 52. You know what? God is calling us to preach that gospel and to have that gospel and that truth all the time with us. You know, Paul is saying every moment to be ready to respond on the question of somebody. Every moment to be ready. Not to have a joker call pastor, you know. I don't know, something I will call the pastor. Oh, well, people just left. You will not have any more chance, you know. Everywhere of all of us, people are asking for peace. And I believe that this is not just something that will defend you. But as, that can also be, to be a, a weapon for you. The gospel can be a weapon for you. Um, so let's go see Isaiah 52. Um, I don't see very well on English, so I will read on Croatian, but you have on English on your screen. Kako su ljubke po gorama noge glasonoše radosti. How beautiful the foot of the people who are, who are having good news. The gospel. How good the feet of those people have a good news who are proclaiming the peace, who proclaim the peace, who bring good things, who are proclaiming salvation, who are screaming, your, your God raise. How beautiful we can be to somebody. How big blessing we can be for people and bring them peace. Do you know what we have? We have amazing things. We have truth. We have peace. We have salvation. We have everybody, everything here, but we are walking through this life like we don't have nothing. Every time when I feel people, when I met people from church or everywhere else, what are they saying? Oh, I ask, how are you? And they're saying like, oh, don't ask. I don't see somebody who have a good news. I don't, ha I don't see somebody who have something good to tell me or to give me peace. 
But we are called to wear this all the time. Not just that we will be protected, that we will feel. But do you know that gospel, by preaching the gospel, the enemy will be destroyed. If we more preach the gospel everywhere, when the first century gospel was preached like never before, the enemy was shut up. He was not able to do anything. Never, never, never stop to preach the gospel and share the gospel. You have to be gospel. You have to live the gospel. If you can't preach, you don't know how to preach, then leave Jesus. Leave gospel. That will be the greatest sermon. And that's why even Isaiah is saying here, and he's saying the last verse, I like this last verse, saying, be joyful and click to the same creation because God saved Jerusalem. That's what we have to proclaim. That's the gospel. Everywhere we go, we have to all day walk and saying the gospel. That's not something what we are saying once on a week on our Bible study classes. We are talking about good things from the Bible. That's something what we are living. I was just, I was just talking uh, last week with somebody from the church that is saying in the same week, whatever he's sick, he, he didn't care. He knows that we don't have any more much time. He just sit and he talk with people about salvation. He's not even waiting anymore for the perfect time. When perfect time? Jesus is coming so soon. We have to give gospel of peace to people because they're so, so desperate. They're so in depression because they don't know the truth that we have. You know, all these things. It's not just that we will be protected, that that will be good for us, that we will know the truth, but also we will be something, we will give something to everybody all around us. The problem is when we not study the truth, when we are not study the Bible, we are not preaching the gospel, when we are not living the gospel, not just that we are insecure and we are naked and, and that we are like target for Satan, but also we are not giving that hope to people all around us. And what the Peter, second Peter is saying, that all purpose of our living, our living is salvation of other people. My salvation and people's uh, salvation of people. So that's kind of my duty. All of this that I know, all this studying of the Bible is not just for myself. It's for all people uh, all around us. And we are not accidentally in the family, this family that we have. We are not accidentally put in the workplace we are now. We are not, my husband and I, we are not accidentally put in this church. You're not accidentally in this church. You're not accidentally watching this. Everything has a sense. You have purpose in this life. And that's not underestimated enemy. And thinking that you can do whatever you want. God is with me. You know? That is actually studying and studying and preaching the gospel. And the fourth, it's shield of faith. You know, when, when we talk about faith, we can have as many sermons about the faith. But my biggest sermon was my mom. I, as a little, I didn't understand the word faith. Everything what I understood, the verse from the Bible that is saying faith is believing in something that you can't see and you're waiting to come. That's faith. But I see practically in my mother. And I saw that she had many struggles in her life because she wanted to be faithful to God. But even, even it looked like everybody is laughing to my mom. Everybody, all, all, all is looking that she don't have a job, she's a poor woman, she doesn't have nothing, she didn't lose her faith. And because of that, I didn't even need to study about faith. I just have this faith of my mother. I saw by my eyes what God did in my mother's life because she was faithful to, but faithful to him. And I know that faith of my mother protected her and blessed her family. And through the faith of my mother, I am here today, my husband is here, pastor, um, and others whom I'm studying as a Bible worker. And uh, you have us here in the church also, but because of faith. And you know that shield? We often think that shield is just something, something little that they had. Actually, the Roman shield was something more, the most powerful, you know, because they were walking and they were protected. But even if something happened, they will just just kneel a little bit like this and they will be protected from head to the bottom, to the, to the toes, because it was big shield. It means that faith is covering us all, it's saving, it's saving us all. And it has to be practical. It can't be just a little shield, you know. Yeah, I have faith. You have to leave your faith. You have to show your faith to people. It has to be practical. Um, and then the next one is helmet of salvation. Let's go repeat a little bit from the beginning because you probably already forgot. 
If you're in your home, just a little bit stretch. We are close to the end, okay? So a little bit arm, get up from your, from your seat. It's got belt of the true. Okay, so what we said, the true is foundation. True matter, okay? It's not for nothing. It's not just believing in whatever, what. You have to know the true. The true will save you. And then is a breastplate of uh, righteousness. It's just that we are justified, that God loves you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. Even when you were a sinner, don't feel bad. Okay, you, ha you can feel bad about sin, but not about you because God loves you. And then is the feet. Uh, and actually the word is saying fitted, but it's saying also prepared. That's what is missing here. It's prepared. Like our feet are prepared to share the gospel of peace. All the time we want to share gospel of peace and to, have, and to be covered by that peace. Uh, shield of faith. Um, yes, to have a faith in life. Look what Psalm 56, 3 to 4 say. Can you just, yeah. When I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. When? When I'm afraid. I believe that that's the most important moment and we need faith. When we are afraid, I will put my trust in you. It's easy to talk about faith now when I'm preaching, but you have to have a faith when you really struggle in a, in a life come. But he said, when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you because there is nothing else that can help me. That's actually faith. Assurance that nothing else can actually help you against Satan and against his fire, against the lion who is coming to destroy you. Um, there is a little thought maybe, you know, Satan is not visible and we can't see what he's doing and what is he's moved, but we can believe in another invisible uh, force that can see and is stronger. We saw in 10 verse is stronger than Satan. So in who you want to put trust in you or in God who can see every Satan step and protect you as a shield, have a faith in God, choose to be faithful to him. Helmet of salvation. Okay, helmet was used in the Roman Empire not just as a protection, okay? It was used also to show beauty, beauty of this all army, or armor, okay? So these red things, it, it's just show the, the richness and beauty of the Roman Empire, especially this red color. And it's actually the many uh, out biblical author is, author is saying that in the Roman Empire time, they wanted to show that you have to put, lift your head up because you are the strong army. And that's this beautiful part just show that you are the most strongest and more beautiful army. And when you see the picture like that, and then Paul is saying, you have to head up, to put um, your head up because of salvation, because you're saved. I was thinking about how to give you a picture of that. And then I remember something what happened to me, to, my husband and I, uh, two, two, two years ago, maybe two and a half, when Noah was really little, very little, we were on the birthday party. And it was really beautiful birthday party. All parents together and all kids together. They played all day. We didn't even pay attention on kids. They were here, but you know, they, had, they had a great time. Everything was really beautiful and perfect. But in one moment, um, we saw the many jet ski and motorbikes of that family there, and uh, not just motorbikes, but also boats for the, for the, for the seas, uh, and jet ski for the seas, many things, because the, the person who celebrated the birthday, that was his work, a summer job. He had the many jet ski. And we didn't pay attention to much of that. We didn't saw the danger, because we never see the danger. That's the problem. We never see what Satan can do to destroy you. And our kids were playing, and in one moment, in just one moment, we heard, as all parents, the, the big crash of something and then screaming of the children. In that moment, uh, I started to be nervous. And when something like that happened, you're praying, it's not my child. It's not selfish, it's just natural. You're praying, it's not my child. God, it's not my child. And I went to the house and I was like, God, it's not my child. I was not even able to check if it's my child, how stressful I was. And then I heard a woman who was saying, Noah is under the jet ski. Do you know how tough the jet ski is? Do you know that it's between 130 kilos and 300 kilos? And that fall on Noah, and not just Noah, but also two guys. One, one little boy, he jumped. He was the oldest, so he figured out. But two little boys, Noah and um, Pastor uh, Lukšić's son, they were under the jet ski. In that moment, 
I didn't know if my son is alive. I just heard screaming, screaming of the child that was already saved and screaming of, Daddy, Daddy, help me. Daddy, help me. I, I was not able to, to go, but my husband jumped. They all tried together to put that, to, away that jet ski. I thought my son is, that's, he's not alive anymore because that woman said he is completely under the jet ski. And I was not able to face the truth. I was in, in the house and I was screaming to God, please save my son, save my son. He's too young to die. It was really hurtful that moment. And then, you know what happened? You know what happened when you put God in, trust in God? Under the jet ski, it was one hole like this. Nowhere in the, in the field was not hole, just under the jet ski. So in the place where jet ski fall under these poor two kids, my son f fall in that hole, that hole, and he was all body was in the hole and jet ski just squeezed squeeze him here. So he had the blue and everything on this side of the body, but he was not hurt. He was not broken. And when we come to the doctors and one little boy who was also under and also in this hole, he broke the leg. And the doctors say, this is miracle. We are talking about miracle. Your children are alive. And if any other, he, the, that kids were hit, they will die from bleeding inside. The, all these little bones will be broken. And the and a, a little boy um, that broke the, 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 the leg, it was really bad. But doctors said, that's a miracle. Praise God that you broke that leg because that's the most strongest leg on your body. You know what, what is happening when you put your trust in Jesus, who is actually Savior. He is digging the hole. Couple days, months before the, 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 the trouble will come. When we, because he knows how Satan will want to destroy your family. And he's digging the hole so your child will be safe. And I will never forget the scream of my son when he was saying, Daddy, Daddy, save me. He didn't scream, Mommy. And that would bother me. So I was, I was, a morning after that, I sleep all night with my little son. In the morning, I ask him, did you know that you, 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 you cried for daddy? He said, I know that I cried for daddy. I said, why? Because just daddy is enough strong to save me. There is nobody else who can lift the jet ski but just my daddy. That's why we have to be proud and head up, lift the head up. Because we have a daddy who can dig the hole and save us. We have daddy who is seeing what Satan is want to do for us, that he see what Satan is trying to do, how he's trying to deceive us and destroy us on every possible way, our family, especially your family. And that's we have to be proud and have confidence in Jesus because he is a savior. And Jesus is the only daddy who is strong enough to help you. And that's why you have to put the helmet of salvation on you. You have to put your trust on him. And then is the last one. The, the, the only one who is really a weapon, but also a uh, um, weapon, but also in defend, for defend, for so two things, for defense and for weapon. It's Makaira. So it's not the big sword, it's a little sword. It's for the personal battle. What is actually again showing that this battle is personal. It's not something global, we go to the war. No, we go to the personal battle with Satan. He is personally, personally, he wants to destroy you. Not globally church, you. He doesn't like you because you want Jesus as your savior. And he will try everything. So when I see this word of God, and we know in Matthew 10, in another chapter, in other verses, you can see that the, the, the sword is actually God's word. And I just have a picture of Jesus on this earth. When you see Jesus from the beginning to the end and how he battled against Satan, I, I can see just all these armors in him. I see that he know the truth. Because he know the truth, all these teachers, when they wanted to say, this is the truth, belonging, belonging to Abraham is true. He was like, no, this is not the truth. I will tell you what is the truth. It is written this and this because he know the truth. And also not just because he know the truth, but actually he know it. He know what God he had. He know that God sent him here and that he will protect him. He know that he's here with a mission to save humanity. He know that when he was in desert, when Satan wanted to destroy him, when he is the weakest, when you're the weakest, you have to have faith. It's easy to have faith now when I'm preaching about faith 
and when everything is fine, but it's hard to have a faith when you're in the desert and 40 days you didn't eat. Have faith in God that he's still here and protecting you. To have faith on the cross when you're not feeling God anymore, when you're not feeling your father, when you're feeling the old sin of the world, it's easy or it's hard to have a faith. But he's calling us to have faith even when he doesn't feel that. Because faith is not just feeling. It's not just movement by my heart. It's knowledge that God is the great Savior, that he, had, he know the great plan for you and I, and that he is our Savior. But how to know that? The same way Jesus say, it is written. That's how we will know. We can't anymore have a luxus of not studying the Bible. Our Bible can't anymore be all the time in our armor or our bed or just not read it. it we don't have this luxus anymore. Jesus is coming so soon. Why we think in this last battle that we will be saved? Why? Who is giving you and I assurance that we will be saved? Just the Savior who dig the hole before even you attacked. So put your trust in him. And that's my call on the end. My call is not, my call is not just study the Bible. My call and my question is, in who are you putting trust? Are you putting trust on yourself, on your two hands, on your status, on your job and work that you have. By the way, that you can lose tomorrow of that and not having with anything to pay your house and building. On who are you putting your trust? I know that my son put trust on his father because he, like little son, he know it that his father is the most strongest. And that is my call to you tonight. Put your trust in God. We are fighting with the, the great enemy and he is already defeating us every day. Let's face it. But if we put trust in God, there is no way Satan can wave with our sin. No way Satan can destroy you. Put your trust in God. And just put in trust, you know what does that mean? That means spend time with him. Know the truth. Know your Savior. How my son know it, who is his daddy, the daddy's Savior? Because my hu husband always protected him, always held him, always showed him his strength. So how I will know that Jesus will protect me in a bad time? Because I already have a relationship with him. There is no time anymore for spending time just for our earthly things. There is no luxus for that anymore. Give life to Jesus. All. All your life. Amen.